Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by JEGS, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Please remember to go to JEGS.com for anything you need for your vehicle to fix it up. Well, you know what? There's, uh, there's close friends. There's friends that are closer because you're able to talk to them the way you really want to talk to. And, and this man right here is a dear friend of mine, Cal Petty. Cal, thank you for coming on Kenny Conversation. Man, I have been, I have so been looking forward to this. I was in Bristol this past weekend and they said it was going to rain. I said, it better not rain. I got to be home by Tuesday. I got to be home by, I got to be home to talk to Kenny. That's all I know. See, you were up there, man. You were yeah. up there. I said, did, did I see you eating wings? Yeah, we did. Hey, you know, we haven't even started the show yet, but <laughs> how how about Bristol, man? It, it had that feeling that it was, you know, it's starting to come back. Yeah, it really did. Um the fans brought that feeling. You know what I mean? I, I, the competitors, you know, you listen to what the competitors say and it's da 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 whatever it may be. Uh, but the fans were pumped, man. And it was a good race. It didn't disappoint. I mean, they were, you know, you get caught in traffic, the high groove. It took about a third of the race for that to come in. Uh, I wish they didn't have a gear rule so you could run on the bottom and beat somebody up off the corner and take that position away like the old days yeah. when you run high and run low. But uh, you bog it down on the bottom. But it was, it, listen, it was a solid race. Denny had the best car. Denny was just, I mean, he was on another planet. But he has been the first three races. If you really go back to Darlington and, and Kansas, he's been the guy to beat the first three races. See, th th this is where the Kenny conversation is so awesome because you talk about running the bottom, and I, I believe you are one of the very best at running the bottom. You <laughs> did it so well at Rockingham and Dover. And, you know, Kyle, uh, before the show gets going, I mean, it takes throttle – I know this is a fancy word. It takes throttle manipulation yeah. to roll yeah. that bottom. Yeah, and I, this interesting, interesting little tidbit of information here. So uh, Dale Jr. ran the Xfinity race um, on, on, um, on, on Friday night. But the world already knows that. I'm not, yeah. that's old news. <laughs> yes, okay, that's yes, old news. But it was funny talking to him Saturday morning. He came in and was talk, we were talking. It was he and I and Dale Jarrett. And he said, guys, he said, it's exactly like it used to be. You mm -hmm. let off just past the start finish line, roll off into the corner. Uh, don't use a lot of brake, pick up the throttle about a quarter of the way and just slowly accelerate up off. And he said, next thing I know, I'm driving away from him. And he said, it was fascinating because these young guys drive all the way to the center of the corner until they see God, then try to get the car to turn and go again. And he said, it drove exactly the way it did back in the nineties, back in early 2000s. So that, that was an interesting piece for me uh, to hear somebody who had just been out there. But I, I, I said, when I, when we did the introduction for, for junior on, uh, on Friday night, I said, so here's a guy who's won, who had won 17 races and two championships before Sam Mayer was born. Wow. Uh, and Sam Mayer, Sam Mayer was his, is his driver, you know, his teammate and yeah. they're racing for a championship. That's fascinating to me, but yeah. he did a great job. He did do a great job, man. And the racer in me knows that, like you said, you know, you, you give the fans a little sneak preview. And, you know, Rusty's the one that taught me. I mean, my brother would pull me to the side, you know, you know, roll off like you said and, yeah. you know, squirt that baby across the middle. Then if you got too much head speed, roll up a little bit. But that center of the corner speed, so important. Well, all right, listen, um, here we go. Uh, yesterday, I think Monday, uh, I love your social media. And uh, I want to start conversation out like this. You put a beautiful family picture and, yeah. and you and all the kids at the swimming pool. And you said uh, one last plunge in the pool before winter starts in. Where are we at with kids? I mean, they, I, I mean, you're knocking them out, man. <laughs> <laughs> How Listen, many kids you got now? Here, here, here's the way it works. It's like yeah. I've always said, everybody lives life this way. Yeah. And the only time that I met up with everybody was when I was going that way. Um, so Me it went too. Like that. <laughs> That's the way it is, man. Um, you know, so in the picture, you know, there's Overton. Um, he's my five-year-old. And we're going to drop that picture right now, yeah. right here. Yeah. So Morgan and I, Morgan and I have been married seven years. Overton is our five-year-old. Cotton is the three-year-old. Uh, and the Vant is 13, 14 months, uh, I think, in the picture. And then there's Austin. And Austin's 41. Um, yeah. So Austin is my middle son. Uh, from my first marriage, uh, Adam's brother and, and Montgomery Lee's brother. He's the middle child. 
Uh, and the two little boys, Stone and Rhett, that's that's Austin's little boys. They're um, seven and six or eight and six, I think. Uh, so they're right in there. So uh, it's crazy. You you think you get confused? You ought, you ought to see my dad when everybody comes again. He can't tell who the grandkids are or who the great grandkids are. And sometimes he forgets who his kids are. Uh, he forgets myself and Sharon and Lisa and Rebecca. He didn't even know where we fit in. There's just a bunch of kids at the family. I, I, I am going to tell you this. 1992, when my dad retired, uh, we took a picture out in front of his house uh, with the race car and all of our families and all the ki- grandkids and kids at the time. Um, and there were 19 of us uh, at that time. We did this same thing, um, did the same photo uh, this past Christmas because he wanted to recreate it. Oh. Um, and even though my mom's gone and, and Adam's mm. no longer here, uh, there were 43 of us. Uh, so from 92, number. yeah, that's <laughs> what we said. So from 92, from 92 to 2022, uh, there's 43 of us that, that come out of that house. That's unbelievable. How many square foot is that house? So here's the funny part. I'm going to tell you what it's 10,000 square feet. This is the funny part. It's a 10,000 square foot house that the man actually lives in 600 square foot. I was say, um, he, kind of small he goes in one room and watches TV and then he passes through the kitchen and grab something to eat. And then on the far end of the house, that's how he gets his exercise. On the far end of the house uh, is where the bedroom is. And and that's it. Those are the only rooms in the house he uses. And he lives there by himself and loves it. I, I'm telling you, what, yeah, somebody could break in the house and take everything from the living room all the way out to the-, to he the, the No. <laughs> he'd, he'd never know. He'd never know it was gone, man. He'd oh, probably walk out through it and not know it was gone. I, I'm scrambled age right now because, you know, the Cal Petty charity ride is just is just wonderful. And you are such a good father. <laughs> you help your wife, Morgan, so much with those, those babies. But remembering you tell stories of growing up with your dad and he would come in in the middle of the day and he'd lay down- Yep on the hard floor and, and making some Southern type of country sandwich. What was that? that was, that's no kind of sandwich, man. He made a mayonnaise sandwich. You take two yeah. pieces of white bread and you put mayonnaise <laughs> on both sides. And then you, <laughs> then you sprinkle pepper on it until it's solid black. And then you put them together and then you eat it. And that's why he, he would go to work eight or nine in the morning. Uh, they'd work till lunchtime, 12 or one. He'd come home, make a mayonnaise sandwich, lay down in the middle of the floor, sleep until maybe two 30 or three, take about an hour, hour and a half nap. Um, and then go back to work. Then you come home and have, have dinner with us. And then they go back to work again, because that's the way people worked on race cars then. Uh, and they'd work until 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. So, so they worked on those things. There were only three or four of them, him and Dale and uncle Maurice and those guys. Um, so they worked on those, those things all the time. I, so I have to t- say this. So I told somebody he was inducted into some hall of fame at some point. Another in time. one. Yeah. And I had to do a thing for him. And I told him, I said, I just want you to imagine what Richard Petty, what he could have accomplished in life if he had worked more than half a day in his life. Because he slept a, a half a day. Uh, that's what I always used to tell he people. He he he's sleep. Oh, he's a sleeper, dude. He's a sleeper. He can he goes to sleep about one or two in the morning and he can sleep until 10, 30, 11 o'clock, 1130 the next day. He, he's a good 12 hour sleeper. He's, yeah. he's easy. He's easy. All right. Well, listen uh this is the Cal Petty conversation. So uh, we could go on and it's been documented so much in that awesome book right here. Uh. Uh, what a book. I mean, I love this book. And, you know, so, I mean, I don't want Kenny conversation. I want to talk about, I want to talk about how I know you. So let's start like this. Um, Cal Petty, 829 NASCAR starts, eight Eight NASCAR Cup wins, and and Kyle, eight Cup wins is no joke. I'm telling you, th- this finger here is already a little abused. I'd cut that off. I really would. I'd cut it off to do what you have done. So when you look back, 829 starts. Yeah. I mean, that's way up there in Cup. Yeah. Um, wh- what do you think about? when you look back and, and, and see those stats? You know what? It, it's funny, King. Um, so I, obviously I grew up beside a race shop and grew up going to the racetrack. And um, that's just all I ever wanted to do. Uh, from the time I was little, I'd go to the race shop and sweep. And then they let me sandblast parts. And then they let me spray bomb parts and paint them and magna flux them. And then they taught me how to weld when I was 12 or 13. So <clears throat> they, they let me come through the cycle. And I had to work in every part of the shop 
for a year. I worked in the engine room for a year, worked as a fabricator for a year, worked as a, uh, as a mechanic, worked in the body shop, hated the body shop. Oh my God. Well, me man. too. I, I coughed up Petty Blue paint for about a year after I worked in there. So that's another story. Petty that's Blue. That's a whole nother. <laughs> I the but I love I love the fabricating stuff. I love I love being there. So I kind of fell back into that when I when I went through the cycle. But you know what? That's all we did. Um, and it was so funny when I started. And you know, I started in an ARCA race at Daytona because that was an old cup car. Um, and my dad said, you know, we have cup cars. We, we don't have late model cars. We don't have what was Grand National, which became Bush, which became an Xfinity. We don't have those cars. Those cars at the time were the 311 engines, the wider wheels. It was just a different animal than what a cup car was. And my dad said, we're not buying that stuff. If you want to race, you're going to have to run a cup car. Mm -hmm. So I ran that ARCA race. And then the next race I ran was Talladega, which was a cup race. So I had run two races in my life, one ARCA race, one cup race, because that's what I did. And, and that's what our family did. We run cup cars. So, you know, I, I look at it and it's funny because I came along at a time when my dad's career was at the back end of his career. He wasn't as successful. They could win races, but not like he had won before. Yeah. Um, one day, Tona, you know, um, won another championship um, when, when we were there. Uh, and we had gone from the bigger cars to the small cars, um, which is the Buick Regals, the Pontiac Grand Prix, that stuff. That's from the old Monte Carlos and the old Dodge Chargers. That's that's my reference from old I cars. I remember the downsizing in yeah. the 80s. You know, we yeah. had the big old Oldsmobiles and then we kept oh, the my gosh. Yeah, it was just, track. <laughs> it was a totally different car. To, visually, it was totally different compared to that 74 Dodge Charger, that 76 Charger, or that old 77, 78 Monte Carlo, which was huge, man. Uh, and all of a sudden you show up with a Buick Cut or with an Oldsmobile Cutlass or a Buick Regal, uh, and, the, and the Pontiacs. So it was just a different time. So we were, we were struggling at Petty Enterprises. Um, and I was there for a couple of years and then I went to the Wood Brothers um, and they had never run all the races. They had always just run a limited schedule. So when I went there, we started and got up and running and I was there for two or three years and we ran all the races and it took a while for, for us to get in the rhythm of running all the races as, as that group, as Eddie and Lynn did a tremendous job of yeah. hiring people and running that. And then, um, funny, I told Eddie and them, I said, one day I was up there and I said, I know I'm the only one up here that doesn't have the last name Wood. So when you get ready to fire me, just tell me, man, it'll be okay. Hey, okay. I understand completely. I, I got to stop you right there. Uh, because when I go to, you know, I, I wake up and I, I make my notes, not like Larry Mac Reynolds. <laughs> but I, I make my notes and uh, I'm going to skip way down. Um, you know, and my notes say this. One of the questions that I have for you that is, to me, interesting is what you just said. You're with Petty Enterprises. Yep. But I feel like you went out and, and made your own name. You made, you made Kyle Petty. So you, you drove for Felix. You drove yep. for the Wood Brothers. And I want to be significant on this. What team, was it Felix? Was it Woods? What team did you have the most fun driving for and meant the most to you? So that, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question because it, and, and this, and I'll, let me finish my other thought. When, when, so as when I left the woods, I went to Felix and then I started my own team. So it seems like if you look back at my career, I was always starting a team. You yeah, know, right. I, I was either, I was either with a team towards the end or either starting something to get going. So I've been a part of a lot of startups. If anybody wants to start a team, me call too. Me. I can tell you, I can tell you. And, and you struggle for four or five years, three or four years when you start. I had, I had a blast driving for the Wood Brothers. And, and let me tell you why. I was 23, 24 years old, working with Leonard Wood, a, a guy that I considered the smartest man, mm. maybe ever to walk through a garage area or bumper to bumper. He knew engines, he knew gears, he knew transmissions, he knew chassis setups. He knew everything. You could not throw a problem at Leonard Wood and probably still can't today that he can't figure out on a car. It's a different animal now, but the stuff we ran, there was nobody in that garage area smarter, smarter or willing to work harder than he was. So I learned a lot from Leonard uh, and I learned a lot from Lynn and Eddie because they were just taking over their business. They were just it was being handed down to them. Uh, and it was, it was fun. When I went to Felix, uh, I had no idea what to expect. Uh, honestly, Nobody. yeah, I, just, <laughs> I rode that roller coaster for those first Crazy few years. Just, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I rode that roller coaster for those first few years, but Felix and I 
through time became incredibly tight personally. Um, even though we, we struggled as a team, um, mm. it didn't mean that we weren't good together uh, as people. And that, that's, that's the one thing I've taken away through my whole career. Uh, and, and you're the same way, man. You are the same way is, yeah, you drive a race car and you're loyal to the people you drive for. You could have gone a lot of different places. There, there may have been a chance for me to go other places, but I was loyal to the Wood Brothers, loyal to Felix until they said, it's time, it's over. I'm going to stay here because I told you that's what I would do. I told you I'd come drive your race car and that's the way it was. No matter how we run, we just got to keep working and fixing. And I got that the same way you did. Uh, you grew up with your dad and your brothers working on something. And that's the car you took to the racetrack on the weekend. You took your car and you made the best of it. We took our car at Petty Enterprises and we made the best of it. We didn't fire people and hire people and rotate people. We just dug a little deeper and tried to make things work. So that's kind of the way I, I, I approach those. But I, I enjoyed Felix. Being with Felix was fun. Um, it was different. It was a different kind of racing than I had ever done because I had been with the family. The Petty Woods. Family. I'd been with the Woods family. And here, all of a sudden, I was I was with Felix, um, and Felix was was just different. It was the sport was changing during that time, and you know that with Rick yeah. and Roush and Gibbs and everybody the super, else. The super there. teams were coming in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they were. You it was can... not that. It was not the family farm anymore. It was it was a corporate farm, uh, yeah. and and we just weren't a part of the corporate farms. It's interesting because I asked you. You know, I said you have eight hundred twenty nine NASCAR starts. You got eight Cup wins. And I said, what did you think about it? And you didn't say anything about your success. You went right back to being a, a kid. And, you know, Kyle, uh, I, I noticed that when great athletes, uh, they're really good. And then all of a sudden, like, say, 10 years goes by after they're done, they re they skip that, that part. They go right back to their childhood. Yeah. And, you, you just did the same thing. And I guess I would, too. You know, it's like it's like I kind of forgot about that whole yeah. Hardcore life in NASCAR. And you just did the same thing. Do you think most athletes do that? That you ask them about all their greatness and then they go right back to their childhood. Yeah, because that's where it starts, man. That, that's, yeah. where it start, that's where your dreams are. You know, I, I, I tell people all the time um, and, and this is a part. And, and listen, you are a phenomenal dirt racer and have transitioned. <laughs> and you and you are. And you're still a driver. You, you are still a driver. And I, I think of. I think of Kenny Wallace as a driver, uh, mm. as, as a race car driver. I still do. There's going to come a day. Um, I don't know. Kenny Schrader's still out there doing it. So there may not ever come a day. Uh, I won't be for, Schrader. For, 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 <laughs> but but what I'm but here's what I, what I tell people all the time. When I was a little boy, when I was a little boy, we had all these crash cars out behind uh, the race shop over there. Some of my granddad's cars, some of my dad's convertibles from when he ran a convertible. And they had 43 painted on the side of them or 41 for, for Marvin Panch or, or Jim Pascal guys that drove for my father. And these were just torn up race cars. They would just strip and stuff, stuff them out in the woods. Uh, if you've seen Junior's graveyard, we had an incredible graveyard. I'm going to tell you because it was You're the original graveyard. Years. Yeah, it was 58 <laughs> and early 60s Plymouth and stuff like that. When I was a little boy, we'd go out in the woods and we'd climb up in those cars and sit in the seat and hang on to that steering wheel and play like we were driving, man. And you're out in the woods, you know, and you look over and there's a 42 car beside of you or 43 and you're racing that thing, man. And I tell people from the time I was five or six, six or seven years old, that's all I dreamed about was hanging onto a steering wheel and sitting in a seat. I didn't dream about BSing on TV. I didn't dream about big time sponsors. I didn't dream about commercials. I didn't dream, dream about fans. I'm so sorry. I didn't dream about you guys. I dreamed about hanging onto that steering wheel and sitting in that seat. And then you get out of the car and that's the one thing you can't do anymore. Mm. You, you still can do the fan thing. You can still have work with sponsors and, and do all that stuff. But the piece that you truly dreamed about when you were a kid, you have to put in a box and put somewhere. So that's, that's always sad when I watch guys. Really that's why I've always been happy for you because you just transitioned into something else and you're still hanging onto a steering wheel. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's, so you're living that dream, man. You're just living that dream. So, uh, I think that's a lot of times that's why you go back to to the beginning and athletes do because you know you you dream about standing at the plate and hitting a home run in the, in the mm. World Series or you dream about you know that buzzer beater uh, when you're a basketball player or kicking a field goal or running a touchdown or throwing it whatever you don't dream about all the BS that goes along with sports you dream about the sport itself 
Yeah. Um, we don't know. We don't, we don't know all the business behind right. it. You know, yeah. it costs so much money to do this. Yeah, true. So, so, you know, I can easily tell this could be five hours. Uh, <laughs> no, it really could because I have a lot in common with you. I, I know a lot about you because we were teammates. Let's yep. remind everybody that. Yep. Uh, let's go like this right now. I believe that after you got done racing, I believe you became way more famous because you're a rebel and your, your quotes, your, your answers, your phrases, they ricochet throughout the world and media grabs your quotes because you're strong minded. Um, they, they, they found you media. (laughs) They found you, you didn't ask for it. Yeah. I feel like you're more famous right now than you've ever been. You're on NBC, you're on, on big TV and, and they still pick your quotes up and Kyle, you, you matter because you're a historian and that's another subject. When I say all that, what do you think? Thank you first. Uh, I'll say thank you. And, and, and I think, and I think it all ties together. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm, in, in these ways, I'm a lot more like my mom, uh, mm. like my mom was. Um, and I'm sure you, and do what? Opinionated? Opinionated. And I got it. <laughs> I got it. And you're going to hear. But, but here's the, here's the thing. It, the, the thing is, it's just like we were, we were talking just a minute ago. When I think back to the old car, I think back to the Superbirds of the early seven of seventies of the Ford, you know, of the Torinos and the, and the, and the Talladegas, uh, the, 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 and the Mercury's that the Wood brothers would bring to the racetrack. Um, and those, those cars are the cars of my youth. And those are the cars I think about. And I started driving them. I drove a Magnum. I drove a Monte Carlo, uh, that old Monte Carlo, like you see so many times Earnhardt drove that number two car, that old Monte Carlo, that body style. So I drove those cars. And then transition to the small Buicks and all that stuff. And then transition to the next car with the offset body and everything. And then to the COTs of the early. So I've driven a lot of stuff. And the thing is, so I grew up going to the racetrack when I was six, seven, eight years old, going to, with my dad and during the summers and on the weekends. You know, a hanging lot. out with Pearson and Kale and Bobby and Donnie. Even though you were a kid, you saw those guys, man. You got to hang out with them. And they're gods. They are gods they to this are. sport. And then I had an opportunity later in the 70s when I started racing, Bobby was still here and Kale was still here. Um, Kale and I had a hell of a race at Talladega when Bill Elliott unlapped himself twice for second. And I ended up beating him just barely at the line. And that's one of my greatest moments was beating Kale Yarbrough to the line at Talladega. So I, I, there's moments like that that I look at. And that's where my opinions come from. My opinions come from how I grew up what I've seen in the sport. So when somebody says, well, this, this, and this, and I'm like, yeah, but I remember back to 68 and 69. You're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I remember back to 76 and 77. You know what I mean? So it's different. And, and so I have an opinion and, and, you know, and, and you and I are the same way and in in this way, we've seen a lot of drivers come and go, you know what I mean? And there's, I know a lot of nice guys that can't drive race cars. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And I know a lot of, you know, horses rear ends that can drive the crap out of a race car. Ain't that a um, shame? Ain't yeah. that a shame? <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> a but everybody that drives a race car is not a nice guy, but they're not a bad guy either. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and you know, but we've seen guys come in with all the hoopla and all the pomp and circumstance and never do anything, yeah. never do anything. And we've seen guys that come in quietly that just excelled. Um, and and this, uh, Matt Kenseth is a guy that just kind of slid into the sport went and won a championship and just kind of disappeared. Terry um, Labonte, I think of. Yeah, yeah, Terry Labonte. I mean, so many guys like that. But they left a mark here and because they're great race car drivers. So I have opinions. When I see somebody drive and just taking up taking up a seat um, and, and wasting oxygen because they shouldn't be in that seat because somebody's mm-hmm. got more money than God and they bought them a seat, I don't like that. Yeah, I, I just don't. I'm sorry. Because uh, you were in the race shop. Yeah, you were yeah, at right. enterprises, sanding things. You you, that's you right. greased wheel bearings. <laughs> that's right. You pack wheel bearings. You, yeah. you put rear ends on the car. So I, I don't like that because I know there's a kid out there somewhere who has worked his knuckles and worked his fingers until they are bloody, dreaming about sitting in that seat and holding that steering wheel. And he's not going to get a chance 
because some 14 year old decided he saw Jeff Gordon on TV and I want to be a superstar like Jeff Gordon. Mm -hmm. Daddy, can you buy me a seat? And he gets a seat. And I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan. I've seen guys come in that way who have been phenomenal race car drivers, but I know there's guys in the sport right now who are just wasting oxygen, man, just right. taking up a seat somewhere and a good car. Somebody else could get in that. And maybe we're missing an opportunity at the next Earnhardt, at the next Jeff Gordon, at the next Rusty Wallace or Jimmy Johnson or whoever that may be, because he's never going to get a chance to sit in a seat. Yeah. You know, I'm going to broach this subject just because I, I feel like I grew up in this era. I, I, when I raced locally around St. Louis, so first of all, I never raced around St. Louis. I was with my dad, my brother, Rusty, yeah. you know, Kenny Schrader and ladies never were allowed in the pit area because that's, that was a man's world. And it was thought of as too rough. The, the ladies are, are goddesses. Let's keep them out of harm's way. Yeah. You know, and I feel like, Here's where the Kenny conversation comes in. I remember your father more so, and I'm not, I don't want you to answer for him, but I kind of, I kind of remember you on this bandwagon too. Yeah. Ladies in the pit area back in the day, the pet, petty enterprises wasn't, you didn't, you guys didn't like the ladies in, in the garage, no. in the pit area. No, it, it had never been. And, and I think that's, that's, it just never happened. You know what I mean? Listen, I remember, and this is a true story. I remember being in Riverside, California. Yeah. When Dick Brooks had a sponsor um, that had a, a female, this is back in late seventies, maybe early eighties, mm -hmm. had a female um, um, VP and she couldn't get in the garage area to see a car that her company was spending hundreds oh my. of dollars on. Hold on, let me back up. NASCAR did NASCAR not allow ladies. NASCAR didn't let women in the garage area. That's wow. exactly right. Yeah, wow. so NASCAR did not allow women in the garage area. Oh, um, and, <laughs> yeah, and here, and, and again, here is a corporation who is sponsoring a car in a NASCAR series, in the elite NASCAR series. And the woman who is in charge uh, of the, the finances for that, that company can't get in the garage area to see the car because they don't allow women in the car. And that's the way the sport was. That's yeah. just the way the sport was. And, and I'm going to say something. I, so my dad did an interview. I'm, I'm going to throw this out here. My dad did an <laughs> This ought to be good. <laughs> yeah, my dad did an interview and he was asked that. He said, what do you think about ladies in racing? Yeah. Um, and, and my dad's answer was, um, there are no ladies in racing. And mm -hmm. the, the reporter that asked it said, named off, rattled off five or six. And he said, oh, you mean women in racing? My mm. mother's a lady. Mm. My mother-in-law is a lady. And my wife is a lady. And a lady would never drive a race car. A mm. woman might, but a lady would never drive it. So it depends on the phrasing in the South on which way you want to go. You know what I mean? And, and that's the way he looked at it. And, you know, I think his opinion has changed. But, you know, the, the technology's changed. The cars have changed. Everything has changed. Life. Remember, you know... Rusty's a big old boy, man. Rusty's tall. Y'all are big old guys, you know? And and you look at it, and now you look around the garage area, and... Oh, you jockeys. Know, yeah, these <laughs> guys. You know, Matt, you, we grew up with manual steering. You know what I mean? We grew up with so many different things that that it's just different. It's not it's better. Strong. It's not worse. It's not easier. It's not harder. That's not what I'm saying. It's just different. Um, and, and the world changed along with it. And that's why, you know, we went at Petty Enterprises when... In the early 2000s, you know, we had a couple of female engineers that were the smartest engineers we had. They were incredible. Um, and they looked at the sport totally different because they looked at it strictly engineering. And it was so refreshing to sit down with Margaret and a couple of them and just go through the data. And she would pick things out that I would take for granted. And I'm, that's good. And she's like, no, that's bad. And this is why it's bad. And you get to think and it's like, oh, my gosh, I understand. Alba. Um, you know, was Chevrolet back in oh, the day. Oh, Chevrolet, yeah. man. She's wonderful. Incredible woman. Incredible woman. Incredible woman. And an incredible pioneer in the sport for that part of it. Um, and I had an opportunity to talk to Janet Guthrie and what she went through. I can't imagine what she went through. Mm. Um, it, that, that was tough for her. We talk so much about what Bubba goes through or what, uh, you know, Bill Lester or, or, or other people have gone through in the sport. What she went through at a time in the 70s is, is, was horrific. So, but the world changes and the whole sport changes um, and it changes for the better in a lot of ways. But let me say this, uh, for, from my viewpoint, uh, 
I always like to me, the ladies, you know, like when I would talk to my wife about this, Kim, she would say, Kenny, I'm a girl. I, you know, I don't want to be in the dirty old garage yeah. area. It's, it's dangerous. So for, from my viewpoint, Kyle, we didn't say ladies weren't, shouldn't be in the garage from being yeah. mean. It was like, Hey, you ladies are, are dainty. You're, you're the love yeah. of our life. We don't want you in this dirty, nasty, scary area. Yeah. It was just a different way. As, listen, it was a different way of looking at it. We grew up at a different time. Yeah. Um, and, and that doesn't make it right or wrong. That's not an excuse one way or the other. Yeah. It's just different. Listen, I can't go back and fix my childhood. I can't go back and fix how I was raised. And Where I don't want to. So I'm going to keep some of those values and, and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to move forward from where we're at now. That's all, that's all any of us can do, whether on anything like that, the way I look at it. Yeah. Moving forward now. So you are, uh, when I say, when I say this, I mean, capital letters, you are a free spirit. Free spirit means your hair's in a ponytail. Yep. Leonard Skinner, you're from the South. However, you're going to go to New York to get your hair cut. You know, 30 years ago, the media followed you there. Uh, you know, you're going to grab a guitar. Yeah. Uh, like you did one week ago to an unbelievably sold out concert. So is the free spirit. And I see the Wood Brother kids are a little bit like that from being yeah. in the mountains of Virginia. It, it, it does shock me that. You all are like this, the Wood Brother kids, you, this free spirit, does it come from your mama? A little bit, a, li a little bit. Um, I, I, I think it does. Or are Probably you rebellious? More, yeah, more from her. Well, here's the thing. Here, here's yes. the thing. <laughs> I think this is what she taught me, okay? I, yeah. I think this is what she taught me. And this is what you learn. I, I think you learn this this racing, okay? So, yeah, and and... Yeah, what's that number again? I ran how many races? Eight hundred and what? Eight eight hundred and twenty nine NASCAR starts with eight NASCAR Cup wins. Eight hundred and twenty nine, and I lost eight hundred and twenty one. Okay, oh, stop so, it. no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, but on. yeah, but here's here's my point. Here's my point. I lost eight hundred and twenty one times, yeah. which means that I failed to reach my objective eight hundred and twenty one times because yeah. that's that's the way you look at. It. My dad won two hundred races. Uh, but he lost 915 or, or uh, something. Good point. So you look at it like that. Yeah, good point. But, so the point is, I think the way I was raised and what, and growing up that way is, I, I was not afraid to lose and I'm not afraid to fail. I'm more afraid not to try. I just mm -hmm. want to go try things. And, and that's where that free spirit and that, that rebellion comes from. If somebody says, let's go ride a bull, I'm like, let's go do it, man. Somebody says, let's go, <laughs> oh, man, let's go jump out of a pool. And because I don't want to be, I don't want to get to be 96 years old and in an assisted living home and hear everybody else's stories. I want to hear when I'm at the nursing home and somebody says, anybody ever ride a bull? I'm going to raise my cane in the air and shake it. And then you will lead the group. Yeah, any, <laughs> you know, anybody ever fly around the world? I'm going to raise my hand, you know, just whatever it may be. Yeah, now, I love it. I, I I was only on that bull for like 0.9 seconds, man. It wasn't like I rode the bull. I just sat on the bull and he threw me off. But at least I sat on the thing. You know what I mean? So that's my point. I think I think that's the way I, I was raised, not only from my mom, um, but just the atmosphere you're raised in. You're going to lose. You're going to get beat. But that doesn't mean you don't go try. It. You got to go try. You yeah. got to go try. And you got to give it everything you can while you're trying. And then pick yourself up off the ground and go do it again. And that's what my granddad did. And that's what my dad did. And that's what I do. Yeah. And in that same arena, uh, you've been to the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, you know, when you and I worked together at Speed or FS1, you would bring your guitar and, uh, you know, you don't drink, but we'd all grab a little bit of beer and we'd come into your hotel room, be about six of us. And yeah. you're not shy at all. You just picked that guitar up. So, and, and, and we'd have a good time. And yeah. I, I love that so much about you. And you've taught me to be who I am. But you just got done playing a concert last week to, yeah. to, to sold out. Where where do these songs come from? Where do your <laughs> where do your guitar skills come from? Because I couldn't play a guitar if you if I tried. I, I want to because <laughs> I want to be cool as you. Yeah. That's so right. awesome. Tell so, me about yeah. these songs. You know, I, I don't know where the songs come from. I, I honestly don't. Listen, I, I I tell people all the time, I was, when I went to school, this is a true story, King. When I went to school, I hated reading, man. I hated yeah, reading I more than anything. Time. 
<laughs> and I had a teacher. Finally, when I got got to the fourth grade, fifth grade, right along there, I had a teacher, and she talked told my mom. She said, "He's got a reader. We're gonna we're just not gonna let him go forward. He's oh, this wow. is as far as he's gonna make it." So my mom said. So the teacher said, "What does he read?" And my mom says, "He he reads. He's constantly in with his nose in Speed Sport News or in Stock Car Racing Magazine." And mm -hmm. The teacher said, send me some of them. So my mom took a stack of stock car racing magazines and a stack of speed sport news. Awesome. And my teacher circled them with a, a, a magic marker. And she said, I want you to read this story and write me a report on it. And I would read yeah. it, anything, man. Man, I read about Lloyd Ruby. I read about David Pearson. I read stories about guys that run Richie Evans running modifieds. And I'd write a, write a report. And that's how, I, that's how I got through fourth or fifth grade was because the teacher had enough sense to know I didn't care about the other stuff, but she said, you got to read no matter what. So the song stuff ha has kind of. That's who you are. That. And doing that, it's just kind of stuff I've done and stories I've, I've experienced. I just started writing stuff down. The music stuff come from Marty Robbins because Marty Robbins used oh, to go. El Paso he, City. Oh, yeah, baby. He was the best <laughs> guy I ever saw. He used to come to the racetrack and he'd sit by the pool and play guitar. Oh, uh, really? That had to be was, unbelievable. Oh, it was crazy, man. You'd be out by a swimming pool in Talladega, Alabama, and Pearson be sitting there, my dad, Bobby or Donnie, and there'd be a bunch of fans who ever stayed at the hotel. You know, it'd be 20, 30, 40 people hanging out. And Marty would just be sitting there singing, you know, Big Iron on his hip or El Paso or some of his- What a great songs. story. You and saw it, the best And I time. thought, oh my God, man, I, I'm going to learn to play that box, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get me one of those things and learn to play it. And that's- I was 12 years old, I think, then. So I learned to play when I was 12 or 13. I, I've never got any better. I'm 63 now. I never got any better, but I still play. <laughs> hey, I'm going to tell you what. Now, out of, out of everything we just talked about, to me, that takes my mind. And I'm, I'm like in a hallway. I'm focused. in Because I can remember, you know, us staying at, uh, was it Thunderbird in Florence? Uh, oh, yeah, man. And, and all the teams would wear white. And, you know, I, I came in in 84. And, you know, all the crew members would drag a cooler. Yep. Out of their bedrooms. Yep. And we'd all from say they kick us out of the garage at five and yep. we drink beer till seven. And yep. God, those were the days, weren't they, Kyle? They were, man. Remember? And listen, you talk about carrying a cooler. We you get a cooler, you order pizzas, hang out in the parking lot, whatever it may be. Remember, we um went to Riverside and changed over those cars in the parking lot, switched over the 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 fuel necks and everything <laughs> and we're just yeah. out in the middle of the american motor lodge in riverside california welding and grinding and cutting and so we're just all there together this. everybody's working on everybody else's cars yeah. that's the cool part about it i, I gotta tell that story real quick because i'm proud of that uh 1984 the team that i was with the levi garrett team we took our car and we piggybacked is what they called it back in the day and we put that levi garrett car with driver joe ruffin on your hauler the 711 yep. I was at the 7-Eleven car. Yeah, 7-Eleven. Well, I wanted to help you. And uh, you said, Kenny, uh, you know, I take my battery from the left, put it on the right, take my fuel neck. And I kind of, you know, when I look back on it, I said, holy crap. You know, here I am out of Arnold, Missouri, working on, you know, we, we were all together. That's right. We were all together, man. It, you know how it was. You travel down the road, truck break down, everybody had stopped. Pull over. And, and, you, and you went together. And then you you, you go again. And, and trucks broke down then. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not, it's not like it is now, man. You used to break down on the side of the road, have to change a tire by yourself on one of those big trailers and stuff. So, um, but that's that was the spirit. That was, for me, and, and you talk about coming out of Arnold, Missouri and going with your dad to the racetrack. That's what people did at a local racetrack. They, yeah. they helped each other. Man, something happened, you help each other. You just happened to be with in a different league in a different place, but the people were the same people. They were the people that came from from Arnold, Missouri. They were the people that came from, you know, the mountains of Virginia or, or you know, of, or Tennessee to work on race cars. And that's what they did because the race car was the common denominator and that's all they loved and all they cared about was being able to, to go. And there was, listen, you know it, there was nothing better than loaning a guy your parts or your springs and then going out and kicking his butt. Yeah. Um, you know, but you loaned it, you tried to help him. Hey, I tried to help you, dude. I just had to beat you in the end. Sorry. Yeah, you, you know, uh, there's an old saying, be careful, young man, competition to kill you. But on the other hand, you don't want to race by yourself. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you have to have people to race against to be good. Yeah. Well, I believe, you know, obviously that's where your 
historian, your storytelling comes from because, you know, Petty Enterprises, who were you without racing against Kale yeah. or Donnie? Uh, we we got to have competitors. Yeah, you and you know it. You saw it. You saw it when you came up. You saw it in Rusty first. You, you probably saw it in Rusty first. You saw Rusty race local and then move to ASA. And he had to up his game when he went to ASA because yeah. he raced against better people. Mark Martin, Dick Trickle, Seneca, those guys made him a better race car driver. Wait. You know what I mean? And then when he came to Cup, those guys, Earnhardt and, and all those guys, made him a better race car driver. Same with you. As you come up and, and you're racing against Tommy Ellis and, and all these guys, they make you a better race car driver. Well, I, I'm sorry, you got to get better or you get out. That's the way it works. That's where you I learned to get gnarly at South yeah. Boston and Rouge. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> you you got to go, you got to go do it and you got to stand toe to toe. Whether you have the experience or not, you got to make them believe you can stand toe to toe with them and yeah. you get better because of that. And when that race is over with and you've run second to Jack Ingram Man. and you've been banging on his rear bumper, you go back to the hotel and you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, damn good job, man. Yeah. I'm becoming a race car driver. You know what I mean? Because those guys, even when they beat you, they made you a better race car driver. So that's, that is, that's always, yeah. Competition. You play against better people. There's a lot of big fish in little ponds that think they can do it, but when they get to a big pond, they don't always get to do it. Yeah. They don't, they're not always that good, but a lot of guys rise to that occasion. And that's when you get to Xfinity and you get to the cup series, those two ponds are, are big, big ponds, man. If you can win in those series, you're doing good. You, you know, uh, you, you mentioned something right there that just really hit home. First of all, NASCAR is the biggest form of motorsports in America. Uh, you know, Formula One's doing their own deal. But everybody, I even talked to Jonathan Davenport about this, you know, the greatest dirt racer in yeah. our era. Everybody says, oh, yeah. I mean, everybody wants to be in NASCAR. So you bring up a good point. When you go to NASCAR, I mean – in reality, most of the drivers, if you put them in a dirt car, they're going to kick ass. Uh, you know, everybody is – what is that, Kyle? The best get to NASCAR. Why is that? You know what? They just find their way there. Um, Sometimes. And, and, I don't, and, I, and I don't know – and listen, and I don't, I don't know – I don't know how. I, I always and, – and I know you're, you're the same way. You know, when, when you run a cup and you run the Xfinity – and you and you look and you roll into a racetrack, and and let's let's throw the truck let's throw truck series. If you say the truck and the cup, our truck Xfinity and Cup on any given weekend, and, and you roll in there and there's thir let's we'll just use a number of thirty five so that that's what seventy that's one hundred and five. In my opinion, there's a hundred and hundred and five of the best drivers that 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 we have that NASCAR has in that racetrack on that weekend. You know what I mean? And, and, but the fascinating part is there's somebody out in Iowa that's kicking butt that could do it too. Yeah. There's somebody down in South Florida who's kicking butt that could do it too. There's somebody running midgets in Texas or sprint cars in Texas that could come and do it too. He just hadn't had the opportunity. The trick is when a new one comes in, one gets kicked out. Um, and, and we're seeing that this year with some guys retiring, like, like, Harvick and those guys return. But the, the, the thing is, is it, you want to get there because it's like the big stage. The you automakers, I mean? the automakers are trying to find the best, right? Like with yeah, Kyle Larson, Christopher Bell. Yeah, they're trying, you know, Toyota. Um, remember we used to have the gong show with, with Roush. Oh, the, the oh I remember that. Yeah. Oh, the, the owners yeah. used to try it and now the manufacturers do it. You know what I mean? And, and some of the manufacturers do a good job. Toyota does a great job at it. Um, but, the problem is, and, and this is the problem with, with any of these scenarios, is so Kevin Harvick retires, and, and there's an opening there. But when you look around the garage area and you look at, and, and I'll take the Hendrick organization, when you look at William Byron, uh, Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, um, Alex and Bowman. Alex Bowman, listen, there may not become a seat open up there for another 10 years. 10 years. They're young. Yeah, they're incredibly young. So that means there's a seven or eight year old out there, mm. okay, or eight yeah. or nine year old. Good point. That if he starts now, he may get a Hendrick ride in 10 years. But that, that guy that's 16, probably not going to get a Hendrick ride because there's just no opening. You know yeah, what I mean? It, it's, a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy way of looking at it. But there's, listen, there's a lot of people 
and, and my dad used to say this and he'd get mad at me because I wasn't doing something right. And he'd say, you know, what? I, I could probably go up in the grandstand and get somebody to do about the same thing. <laughs> and, and I used to laugh at him, but the older I got, I realized there probably was somebody sitting in the grandstand on certain days that would have been a better choice than Kyle Petty just sitting in a race car. And in all honesty, because there was probably somebody there who run a local short track who would give his little finger, like you said, to just sit in one of those things and hang on to a steering wheel. And, and when you have that desire in that heart, man, you can't see that. You can't see that from the outside. You can't see it until they get in the car. You know, Kenny Schrader used to say something that made me laugh, and he, and he still will say it, but I mean this serious. It, it's almost it, it, what we're talking about right now that, you know, and, and Dale Sr. told me this. Herman, there's thousands of great race car drivers all over the world. Yep. And, and Schrader would say, it's not how you run. It's how you place the blame. And we'd all laugh. But – you know, Kyle, it, it is extremely hard. And I think it's impossible to have the greatest drivers. So, I mean, it's just something that it's a conversation point. It's something we live on. And, yeah. and one more quote, I'm, I'm that old now that uh, it was Bill Elliott. He said, Herman, it's all about timing and circumstances. So Kyle, I don't think this subject yeah. ever gets solved. Yeah. And that, no, it doesn't. It, it Listen, it, it never does. And it never will. And it never right. will. And it, and it is all, it's all about timing, being in the right place, um, going left instead of going right, whatever choice you choose that day. You got up at 6.05 instead of getting up at, at 6.30 that day, yeah. and you were the first one there. That's just the way it is. You know, and I, I used to tell people all the time, we used to get, we used to get a thousand resumes at Petty Enterprises for people to come to work. And we never really paid attention to them. But if a guy quit and you walked in, you got the job. That's how simple it was because you just, you were right place, right time. That that's, but it is the, the funny part to me is I don't think as you look back through and everybody wants to, you know, this guy was great. This guy was great. This guy did this, this guy did that. Yeah. You know, it's hard to compare eras in this sport because they just continue to change. We have been incredibly blessed. I think in this sport to have so many great drivers who have won championships who've won, you know, 50 plus races, I mean, that, that 50 number. And, and I'm going to, I'll say this, that 50 number and, and, and Rusty's in the 50, what's Rusty one? 55. 55. So that 50 number is in the future and in, in the future to me and the not too distant future is going to be like that 200 number of Richard Petty. Mm. You're not yeah. going to get 50. You know yeah. what I mean? You come along now, yeah, and, and if you you end your career with 30 or 35 wins, because these guys are going to retire a little bit sooner, the competition is so much greater. You don't see guys winning 10 races a year. You don't see guys winning nine. Or, I can't believe William Byron has won five this year. It, you know what I mean? It is on the Yeah, so you get – that's a huge, huge year, five wins. But you get three or four wins, you get two or three wins. You know, you get three wins a year, and you run 10 or 15 years, you're only at 45 wins. You're not going to get to 50. I'm sorry. And, and it's, it's that number – is going to be so elusive, man. So if you've – those guys that have won that are, are rare talents who have gone above that 50 mark are rare talents in this sport. So here we are at 46 minutes already, and you're making me think differently, and, and we, we got to start wrapping it up. But I knew this would happen. So, <laughs> so it, my I, I want to hear your opinion on this. Okay. Here's what I believe. I believe 40 years old is the new 50. So we saw Harry Gant. We saw Rusty. We saw your dad. But as you bring up, you said this. Now these kids are starting racing at five. Tony Uri Jr. has got his five-year-old kid. The helmet's just a bopping around in the go-kart. They're starting at five. And when they get to be 40, it's like being 50. So, so Kyle, more drivers are retiring at 42 yeah. now more than ever. What's your thought on that? Yeah, so I, I think you're going to see that. And, and for, for a couple of different reasons, um, you know, we look at, you know, what's Joey Logano, 31, 32, something no, like 33. I'm... Yeah, he's early 30s. He's early 30s. Uh, Kyle Larson, you know, late 20s, early 30s. I don't, you know, William Byron, mid 20s, right along there. So I see your point. They've already yeah, done it all. <laughs> yeah, they've already done. They've already won championships. Two championships. They've, yeah, yeah, they've already won races. And, and the thing is, they, they don't, they're going to get to that place that 
and and Kyle Bush is a perfect example. I did a, I did an interview with Kyle Bush, and we were talking about the truck. I team. love your all your shows. Yeah, Dinner no, with Kyle, you. the coffee. It's all yeah. good stuff. Thank you, man. But we were talking about the truck team, and his goal is to to run long enough to run a few more years in Cup, whatever that number may be, then step back and run the truck series until Brexton. his son comes. Then so Brexton comes. Then they run together for a year or two. Oh and my then he gosh. steps out. So that's his exit strategy. That's not Kyle Bush running a cup car at 45 years old. That's yeah. just not. His strategy is already in place for where he wants to be. And, and that's what I'm saying. These guys will get to their late 30s. And the point is, at 37 or 38, if, if I take if I take some kid out to 37 or 38, you've got Braxton Bush coming along, who's got tons of experience. They're in the pipeline. Yeah, already there. He's coming along. <laughs> so the thing is, the younger drivers with that and with all this simulation that they got now, they can, can spend believe that? days and days and days in a simulator and just get so much. More. You and I, we would go, you know, you go to Martinsville, you get two hours of practice in the morning, two hours. So that's that four hours. It. They can spend four hours in a simulator before lunchtime, go eat lunch and come back and spend three or four more. They get double the experience. It's simulation. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, it's, it's really good. I've never even seen it. Yeah, but we, but, but the thing is, you're seeing these guys learn a different way. They don't have to wreck cars. They don't have to do it. They learn, and the way the car is with all the simulation and all the things, engineering wise, it's just a different animal. So it's going to trend to a younger driver, and the older drivers, I believe, are going to be have to retire a little bit earlier. So, like you say, I believe you're. That's correct. The forty is. 40 is the new 50, you know, yeah. from, from that perspective. And when you get to that, that's where the win total comes down. That's where the top fives come down. The top tens come down. All those numbers are going to have to be adjusted to a different place because we're not going to see guys, you know, run seven, 800 races in a career anymore. It's yeah, just yeah. not, it's, it's the, the market that won't stand it anymore. We, uh, we, we got a group that goes to the movies every Tuesday night. It's we're cheap here. It's like $5 a night at the movies. Well, Last week, we saw a really good movie called Gran Turismo. True story about sim drivers, you know, over in Formula One or, you know, the 24 hours. And uh, I am caught off guard. You know, I, I guess there is simulation for airplane pilots. Yes. And I guess they've really made this real for yeah. racing. I mean, it's the real deal, ain't it, Kyle? Yeah, it is. It is. Listen, I, I was, I have a pilot's license. Rusty has a pilot's license. Um, long, many years ago, I was fortunate enough to, to go to Winston and get in a simulator uh, and try to land a jumbo jet wow. in Chicago. Uh, and let me tell you something. When you miss the runway in a jumbo jet, even if it's on a simulator, it is a weird feeling because you feel like you are in You're that in jet. It. You know what I mean? And, you, and the adrenaline's pumping. And that's the way these cars are. That's the way the simulation is now. It's it's not, you know, there's our racing and there, there's all this, but there is so much. It is so technical. Um and, and, you know, it, a lot of guys are, you know, I don't want to do that. You know, M Martin Truex, I don't ever go do that. But we heard this week, Martin Truex spent hours in the simulator getting ready for Bristol because he needed to move out of this round to the next round. Uh, Kevin Harvick, guys like that who didn't grow up that way are having to relearn it or, or having to go back a little bit. But now we see guys like Alex Bowman, who's just spent years in a simulator like William Byron, who has spent forever on iRacing and in a simulator. Yeah. You know, Josh Berry, who came up that way. And that's that's how you, people begin to know who he was from iRacing and stuff. So when you look at it, there's another door that's opened up for these guys to come into the sport. And they're going to come in younger. And they're going to be better at a younger age. But I just don't think they're going to they're gonna ride that wave like, like Rusty did, like my dad did, like Bobby Allison did, like those old guys did. Um, but – the other thing, too, is this, and I'll, I will say this is another factor. Bobby Allison, David Pearson, Kale, my dad, all those guys, they drove until they were 51 or 52 because they had to make a living. Make a living. That, oh, good, that's how they made point. a living. That, that's point. it. They didn't have the option to retire at 38 or 45. They had to make a living for their family, and they had to keep the businesses that they were part of in business. Now these guys make so much money. Yeah. That, honestly, you know, they could retire they're at 26 out. or 28. Carl and, and, Edwards. Yeah. And they're out. They don't have to. And they never they never look back and they don't they don't regret it from a financial aspect. Um, if, if those old guys retired 
uh, early like that, man, they would have regretted it for the rest of their life. Um, because, and, and they love the sport. It was a different love than it is now, I think. Uh, we're coming to the end of Kenny conversation and I have something on my mind and, you know, I can be a prick like you can, <laughs> but, but I also am a lover and, you know, my, I, I was, uh, miserable my whole life in the cup series, just miserable. And my mama knew it and, um, she would always try to help me through it. And she would say, you're going to get your due. And here I am 60 years old now. And I love my life. Yeah. Uh, this is the happiest I've ever been. And my mama would say, see, I told you. And I, I just want to say, from my viewpoint, uh, you're the best Kyle Petty that I've ever seen yeah. right now. Uh, there's something about getting older that I appreciate more. And, and Kyle, I appreciate you more right now uh, for what you do. Uh, like I said, you and I can be smart asses and we'll go to war. But what you do for that banner behind you, for your son, Adam, the Kyle yeah. Petty charity ride, it is unbelievable. Yeah. And you told me, you said, Kenny, you know, I went on it. And I'm going to continue to go on it. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, you, you said, and I want you to comment on this. I know I'm long-winded, but you said, I used to think it was about motorcycles. And you said, it's it's about the people. Yeah. We're in a good place, aren't we, right now, Kyle? Yeah, you know, we are. And, 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 and that, that's the funny part, Kenny, I, I think, and I, I think it does come with getting old. I think it comes with, with, with going through a lot of stuff in your life and you've been Arch. through a ton of stuff in your life. You know what I mean? We, we both have, and, and you learn from that. You know, if you don't learn from it, shame on us, you know, but, but the thing is you wake up one day and you realize, man, I don't have to be the center of attention. I don't have to be the superstar. I don't have to work my butt off. I seek attention. <laughs> yeah. I just, I like people. I like being around people and stuff. And the motorcycle thing, man, I always just loved motorcycles. And the more I ride and the more people that come and ride, and, and you met all the people on our ride. Wonderful. They're just good people, man. They have good hearts. They have caring hearts. They're in every line of business from working on race cars to owning multi-million dollar corporations. Uh, it's crazy the diversity of the of the people that come and ride, but the one thing they have in common is they care. They give back. They want to do something special for camp. They want to do something special for kids, and they like being with each other. And for me, that that's that's the deal. You know, is I don't have time. And 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 you mentioned, you know, the cup. I, I, listen, there were years I was miserable driving a mm -hmm. cup car. The only time I was never miserable was sitting in the seat. Yeah, uh, right. Know, and, and I say that the only time I was never, was getting in that seat and hanging on. And I'll, I'll say that forever. But but the thing is that you you get to that place in life where you just don't want the negative stuff, man. I, I don't exhausting. Hey, just be positive. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full. Just let's do it. You know, looks like and, and it's like, well, it looks like that house is burned down. Yeah, but none of the trees got killed. So that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody's you out. Gotta, you got to find, find the bright spots, man. You gotta find, <laughs> and that's kind of the way you are. And when you look at life from that side yeah. and you don't surround yourself with people that are complaining because you don't drive hard enough or you don't get get the you most out of it. You're on second. Yeah. He's driving two car lanes further into every corner than you are. Well, then get him over here and let him drive this piece of crap because it yeah, won't yeah, go two yeah. cars further in there. We're going to wreck it, you know? But it's one of those things where you just get rid of that negativity, man. That's what's been – that Morgan and these little boys are are the most precious thing. And I know Kim's yeah. always been, and your, your, your girls have always been. You have always been an amazing dad that just heaped praises and heaped love on those Thank kids. And, and you always, man, I, I remember working with you and we'd do stuff and you call your daughters would call or they'd come to the racetrack and Kim was yeah. always there, man. And, yeah. and that, that's special. And that says a lot. That says a lot about you, you know, and that says a lot about the man. I think, I think, you know, I, I will say this. I think we all grow up and we all, we do things, you know, and, and you become known as this guy or that guy or whatever. Um, and that's what you do. But who you are is how you treat your wife and how you treat your kids mm -hmm. and how you treat other people. Um, and you are the man of the mountain when yeah. it comes to treating people yeah. right and being being kind and being nice. You're an example for for everyone and always have been for me because you always laugh, always smile. 
Now you may go in a room and bang your head against the wall. I don't know. I do. <laughs> we, we, we all do that. We, we all do yeah, that. Do. <laughs> but I'm telling you, man, you are. I, I still let me. I, I have to tell you this. I was at a thing last night. And this is a true story. And, and, and I told somebody I was coming to this thing. And yeah. I, I was at a, an event for camp. And a guy said, hey, I got a friend that goes on that ride with you. And his name's John Gurley. And he goes mm-hmm. on the ride. And he said, and John Gurley was talking about when you did that that thing on stage with Kenny Schrader and Kenny Wallace. And I said, awesome. one of the greatest nights on ride history. And that, listen, here I am in North we Carolina. Left. With somebody who wasn't even there, and he's oh, talking we're gonna about drop that picture right here. Okay, he's talking about the Kenny and Kenny yeah. show on the charity ride, yeah. and I'm like, that was that was a fantastic night, and that's who, that's what I take away from all my years in racing is yeah. nights like that and times like that and conversations like this. So I appreciate you more than you'll ever know, and I love you. You know that. Listen, yeah. I put it on Twitter all the time. People think I got a bro crush on you because yeah. I tell you all the time on Twitter that I love you, but we, I do. We, we care about each other. Uh, quickly, before we get to the hardcore uh, ending, which is going to be your opinion on some NASCAR stuff, uh, I know Morgan will like this. Where are we starting this year for the Kyle Petty Charity Ride, and uh, what are the dates? Oh, man. Jenny, when's the dates? <laughs> what? Oh. May 4th through the 10th are the dates. May 4th through the 10th. We're, and we're going, um, we're going from Black Deadwood, Hills? Deadwood, South Dakota. Um, and we're going, we're coming back to camp, coming to Victory Junction. We hadn't ended at camp in a long time, but there's some surprises in between. You got to stay tuned. We're going to go to some cool places this year. It's going to be fun. Forward to the, okay, so uh, I'll, me and my wife, Kim, will be on the Cal Petty Charity Ride. Uh, Kim said, if I ride a trike, she'll ride with me. So <sighs> I'm going to get a trike. I'm yes. not going to buy one, but I'm going to be like your dad. So Yeah, just bomb uh, one, man. That's what my dad does. He just bombs them. Just, yeah, I'm going to give you a try. Okay, so Kyle, we're going to end like this. This will be the, the controversial take. Uh, so I do this with all the drivers. Okay. Uh, your thoughts on, and I have three of them today, uh, your thoughts on NASCAR today. You know, I think NASCAR is in a transition, but in a good place. Um, I think that we, they have finally decided that if you can't bring the fans, if the fans won't come to the sport, take the sport to the fans. Mm-hmm. And I think the LA Coliseum and the Chicago street race are two perfect examples of that. Uh, we went to Joliet and couldn't get the crowd from Chicago to come out. So 50 we just miles went, away. Yeah. So we went to the streets, same thing with LA. You couldn't get them to come to Southern California so, so much. So we went to them. So I think they're, they're good. I think this car, uh, if they continue to do what they're doing with this car, continue to be open to suggestions to tweak it, whether it be stiffness, whether it be arrow, whatever, if they continue to stay open, um, I think, I think they're headed in the right direction. I think there's still some, some weak spots in it. I don't think they're short track program. They don't put on great short, short track races. Um, that's not a good, good thing for this car. The speedway stuff is always going to be whatever it is. Uh, as long as we run those, uh, the engines and try to restrict them, that's always going to be what it is. Uh, but then, but the intermediate tracks and some of it is in, in pretty good place. And I think the leadership is open to, to change. And that's a good place to be. I think Jim France has taken it more of a, of a role, but him and Steve Phelps and Mike Helton and, and O'Donnell and all those guys are doing a good job. Yeah. I like seeing Jim around. He's a, a pretty yeah. cool character. Wears those jeans and just fits oh, yeah. right in. Uh, so the second one is elaborate a little bit more on that. If you don't mind uh, the next gen car. Yeah. See, I, the next gen car is such a departure, such yeah. a departure from anything that you and I ever, ever messed with. Independent you know, suspension. And, and, yeah. You know, we had one lug nut. <laughs> yeah. We were still running trailing arms and track bars and stuff, just like out from under, uh, you know, out from under an old four, uh, old Chevy pickup. Uh, yeah, and the front suspension. <laughs> yeah. Front suspension after out of a 68 Chevelle with the rear steer and all, you know, our front steer and all this. So when you start looking at it, we were running antiquated technology. You know, when they came in, think about it. You couldn't you you couldn't even go to to an auto parts store hardly and buy a carburetor off the shelf. But NASCAR was still running carbureted engines, that's, you know, and that's because wild. nobody had got had they everybody had abandoned that technology. So I think what they did, they basically jumped with this car. If you really look at it from the car that we were running before, and I, I and when I say the car we were running from, it's been a smooth or a slow transition through uh, the early two thousands into to to where we are now, 
but it's basically a transition of about 15 or 20 years. It's yeah, like they, they really yeah, went like boom. They just went the other, years. yeah, sequential shift, independent suspension, rack and pinion. I mean, they just did everything all at once and threw it in there. And then six races into the season, people wanted to complain about the car. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. They put 30 years of technology into a car and just said, go race it. Now there's going to be some weak spots. We're going to have some things that fail. We're going to have some things that work. We're going to have to change some things. And that's why I say, I think if they continue to, to be that uh, and continue to look at stuff like that, um, then then the car will get better. Uh, but the car is a good jumping off spot to be in 2023-24. Yeah. And, and the final question, your opinion on the incredibly hardcore penalties. Now, they seem to have calmed down. But your your whole opinion on the four hundred thousand dollar penalties to Rick Hendrick, and have the teams got the message now? See, there's the question. <laughs> I think because and really because I think as a racer, you never get the you never get the message. Yeah, you know because that's not what you're paid to do. True. You're paid. You're paid. And racing, racing, unlike any other sport, nobody takes the NFL rule book or or major league baseball rule book or or, or golf and they say mm, maybe yeah. i could do this how can i get these I guys? Could. yeah how can i how can i get in between these rules but everyone would take the nascar rule book and say hmm how can i get in between these two rules you know and that's just what you did and that's what you did from 1949 the mm. first time they ever run a cup race yeah. until Rick was, Rick was fine recently. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's just what you do. And and we're going to continue to see that whether it's with hood louvers or whether it's underbody, no matter, you're going to see somebody trying something because that's the nature of the sport. Um, I think in a sport where, and, and I will say this again, I think this, and, and, and I've said it before, a sport where 20 or $30 million is spent on a car, I'll pay a $400,000 fine all day long. Uh, yeah. until you start taking the win and the points and everything else away and make it like I wasn't even there, like I wasn't even there, yeah. then it's, then it's going to hurt me. But, you know, the money is, it goes up. Uh, I think they, I think they do a good job. I think NASCAR does a good job, but they have to do a good job now because they have so many rules and so many things that you can't touch. If I allow Kenny Wallace's team to touch it, it's going to spread through the garage area like wildfire. So I have to slap you hard to send that message. And I think that's where they're at with, with all their rules and all their penalties is I don't like it. And I don't like to see them because I like creativity and I like to see people use their minds. Um, and I'd like to see another Leonard Wood in this sport. I'd like to see another yeah. Ray Evernham in this yeah. sport, somebody creative like that, but that, that they kill the creativity with the rules. And that's just the way it is. And and this is not on my list. But as I listen to you, I, I, that's one thing I try to do when I do these Kenny <laughs> conversations. I try to listen. Uh, so just recently in the news is that, you know, when we watched Bud Moore quit, uh, you know, and we watched uh, Junior Johnson quit, they had nothing. All they had was their building. And then years later, Junior auctioned it off. So now we got the franchises. And one reportedly, and you would know more than me, just went for $40 million. Now, for $40 million, we give you the franchise, and you're guaranteed to sell sponsorship because now you are locked in every race. Yeah. Your opinion, boy, don't you wish Junior and Bud would have seen those <laughs> days. What's your opinion on, on $40 million? That's <laughs> fascinating because, because I, I will go back. Let's go back to – um, when LG DeWitt and when when Junior went out of business and Bud went out of business and all these guys went out of business, LG they had a DeWitt. brick. Wow. They had a brick. Yeah, they had a brick and mortar business. Yeah, they had you know sixty years worth of Ford rear end housings and gears and 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 lower control arms and cars, and they were lucky to get ten cent on the dollar for mm -hmm. everything they sold. Yeah, because it they put their whole life in it. Yeah, their whole life, everything they'd ever done, and they were lucky to get ten cent on a dollar. Now we're in a sport where somebody paid X for a, a, a charter and sold it for almost 400 times what he paid for it. Mm. That's not 10 cents on the dollar. That's 400. That's a multiple of 400 almost. That's, that's good stuff. Paid, which is crazy, <laughs> which, which is crazy to me. And it's just a piece of paper. It's yeah. not anything. It's just 
here's my charter, Kenny. You can have it. You know what I mean? For this much. So it's just a piece of paper. It's just, and it means something. Don't get me wrong. It, it's tangible and it has a value. Um, but I think that totally changes because here's the thing you've got to remember too. The charter that was sold is a charter on the low end of the income spectrum. Uh, mm. It got so much money guaranteed before the year started. You're guaranteed to start every race and you're guaranteed X number of dollars. You're guaranteed. Yeah, you're guaranteed X number of dollars. Now, so I'm a, let, me, let me get my picture here. So that charter was down here. Yeah. Okay. So if that charter is worth 40 and Rick Hendrick owns four charters that are up here, what's a Rick Hendrick charter worth? Oh. Is it worth 60? Is it worth 80? Oh. And he's got four of them. What's it worth? And I, that's I, the fascinating piece yeah. I, for me. I easily see a charter being worth $100 million. Yes. And here's why. Because buy, buy, a, buy an NFL football team. Yep. And, and that's what you pay to get in because you're guaranteed a starting spot. Now I can sell sponsors. Yep. Um, well, listen, Kyle. Yeah, man. Uh, buddy, we set a new track record here. <laughs> a minute, a minute and 14. And I think the most is maybe Tony Stewart at a minute and eight, whatever it is. But uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, as you know, we, we covered so many topics that you can listen to this, everyone, on podcast form. We are starting to show up on podcast form now. Charlie says we're doing pretty good. And you can listen to us on Spotify or iTunes on the way to work. And then turn it back on and listen to it up. Uh, on the way home. So uh, until then, uh, thank you, Kyle. And we'll see y'all later. Thank you, Kenny.